That, and then I guess I can use these droppers. Yeah, I use these too. And, um, And that's enough of a binder, is it? Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's how they make oil paint commercially. And um, yeah, it's how Turner's dad used to mix his paints for hmm. Turner. Now there's probably enough oil there for me to find it. So what I'll do then is get this thing. And are, are, do you find that uh, the pigments are quite expensive? I mean, that depends on which, which uh, pigment I Some are. Some are really expensive, but um, so um, the lapis is really expensive. Yeah. Yeah, pay, um, quite a lot for just a few grams. So, I am. Um, uh, I try, uh, so part of the sort of experience you build up is not using too much oil, otherwise right. it just gets, so, um, and what I find is that the mulling really um, compresses the pigment into the oil, so right. you can get. Well, I suppose different pigments need different amounts of oil anyway. So yeah. So you go to the studio in the morning, you make your colours, and then the afternoon paint? No, no, no. I, I make them as I go along. Oh, right. That's a cute little one. I've never seen one that small before. Yeah. I could do with one of them, actually. Yeah, they're very useful, actually. Oh, it's lovely. So it's a proper oxide, isn't it? Yeah. I'm wondering whether you could actually make it with a rust. And then if you start painting with that, would you add a bit more linseed or...? Um, or well, I saw I use um, a, a bit of... Um, oh, a bit of lambda oil, sorry. That is. Lovely red quality to it. I think I'm going to use Eve, Eve Sound on Rob. So that's basically gorgeous. Yeah. And you can see when you you take a scrape it off and you've got a thin layer of it. Yeah, you see. Yeah. Mm. Um, the quality of colour is. To build that up with something else would be lovely. Yeah. Uh, what do you need? There you go. That's it. We need the canvas now. <laughs> So welcome to the Atelier Melusine in Southwest France. Uh, our current exhibition is Pure by British artist, John Stevens. And today I'm lucky enough to be in conversation with John, who's actually in the UK, not here in France with me. Welcome, John. Hello, Sally. Hi, it's nice a, it's a real pleasure to have been working with you on this uh, project, which is now three mm. years in 
Yeah, yeah, thanks to COVID. Yeah, thanks to COVID and Brexit. Yes. And, um, and there's a lot to ask and go through. And obviously we've had discussions and uh, we've done various other interviews with other people quite recently. Mm. And those conversations, such as the one with Sarah Sparks, uh, brought up really interesting uh, points for me about the the emergence of your style of artwork, because I know you were in university in Germany and went through several stylistic and developmental changes there, mm. which is very normal and natural for any student. But mm. I'm particularly interested in your movement away from more figurative painting into abstract painting mm. and your thoughts regarding overtly narrative or overtly political artwork, because I've heard you speak about these things in your work before. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as you know, I had um, a somewhat unusual art education, particularly um, for the time that, that um, you know, I went to art school, which was, yeah, I, did, I left grammar school in 1963 and did a foundation course in the same town, Cheltenham, that, that I went to school in. Um, at the time, the, uh, the concept of a foundation course was quite new and, and it, uh, there was a kind of tacit um, acknowledgement of the Bauhaus and Bauhaus art educational principles, um, although not entirely, I, can, I, I should add. Um, I was due to carry on studying at Cheltenham, the whole art educational structure in Britain at that time had been ch changed, and um, as as the as it got closer, I, I I thought I really don't know if I want to stay living in the same town I've been at school at, um, and uh, we'd been to see an exhibition of students' work from Berlin during that year, which was touring Britain. Well, when I say touring, it went to Birmingham, I think, and London. And I was quite impressed with it in as much as it seemed to me to do the things or sh show work that the course that I was doing didn't do. And I thought, oh, that could be quite interesting. Now, I was also bilingual because uh, yeah, I grew up as a child in Germany. My father worked for uh, I guess it was the diplomatic service uh, post-war, so I could speak German, so that didn't really bother me. And um, anyway, I, you know, sent off work, they accepted me. And um, in 1964, in November, I sort of arrived in Berlin, uh, thinking, what the hell have I done? And um, because it really was quite alien, it was quite different from the sort of institutions and, uh, and still, and still a divided city at that point. It was a divided city and, and uh, more than 100 miles behind the Iron Curtain. So it was this island city. It was cold in the winter, really cold. I mean, it, you know, temperature dropped to below 20, minus 20. And uh, it was quite, but it was really interesting. I mean, I could see it was going to be really interesting. Um, I, I was probably quite young to be there because most of the students that were already there were three, four, five years older than me. They'd been to other art schools and had gone there to sort of start their artistic careers really. So unlike them, I didn't really have much of an artistic identity. Um, I um, was still finding my way and having been steeped in a fairly figurative um, ethos sort of based on life drawing and observational drawing that's what I continued to do. My professor who was a well-established German abstract painter called Han Trier, um, it was, was I realized later that he was actually a, an excellent teacher because he listened to me and um, sort of nudged me and uh, never put pressure on me, but in the course of these conversations, he did talk about um, 
you know, the language of abstraction and what it might mean and, and how you could exploit it uh, both, you know, in the process of painting and things like colour and gesture and so on. And, um, but it wasn't until towards the end of my course that it actually clicked and, and the clicking came about because of political events that, that happened. Um, um, you were there at a particularly interesting political time, I think. Yes, I was. And uh, so during 1967 and 68, there were huge student demonstrations against the war in Vietnam, but also about um, it was it was the it was the generation of of people whose parents had been implicated in the war in the Third Reich. And so there was a lot of on the one hand, there was that generation that was really trying to re-establish Germany as a, as a democracy. And that's what my father had been responsible for, for re-establishing. And the younger generation who still saw a sort of patriarchal authoritarian bent within that generation. And that's what they were kicking off against, you know, the you know, manifest in institutions, in attitudes, in the press and so on. And, uh, and I got quite interested in this. In fact, I got quite embroiled with it. And uh, up until then, I'd been really apolitical. But I did see how there needed to be a political stance taken um, on a number of things. So, uh, you know, I took part in the demonstrations. I took part in the discussion groups. I took part in actions and so on. And of course, the discussion came around well because most of the students uh, that were involved were um, from the universities they were students of politics economics and other subjects yeah. and the discussion came around to well what 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 can you art students offer what's the role of art within the revolution if you like i mean it was a bit bit of a romantic notion i guess but um but there I'm, be I'm imagining German beer cellars where students and, and activists are well, actually it was quite, it was quite like that it wasn't quite like that it was a bit more serious you know those, those discussions took place in in within the universities and okay. um, I remember a friend of mine giving a lecture about what you know uh, what role art could play and he cited artists who were politically engaged and you know a, a, referred to Ron Kitai and people like yeah. that. It was a bit, um, you know, whilst I could see that, he was a bit sort of um, a bit intellectual. On the other hand, uh, a lot of students turned to using their talents to create um, what, what became agi agitation propaganda, ag agit prop, as it was called. And of course, that was adopted a month or so later in Paris, you know. The, and the agate riots, prop, yeah, the Sorbonne riots. The well. agate prop probably was more prominent in Paris than it, it was in, in Berlin. But in amongst all those discussions, um, you know, there were discussions about Marxism, about Marxist philosophy and so on and so forth. And, and I hit on this idea because that came up a lot, this idea of the dialectic, the idea of, you know, a, a problem, a thesis, an idea that um, needed to be developed or expanded or was inadequate and so and and the, the simple thing I, I mean it comes you know is this, this this idea of you posit an idea there's an antithesis as, as a contrary idea to this and to get a resolution rather than a compromise they have to find something that can push the two forward and give a new have a new relevance so fresh um, a, f a totally fresh approach. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I was quite interested in that. And um, it seemed to me that, um, uh, you, you know, the idea of looking at painting that came out of the Soviet Union as a, an analogy for radicalism, radical politics in the 19, early 19... Well, the late teens and early 1920s, yeah. uh, you know, the art of Elisitsky and Malevich would seem quite uh, relevant. Um, now that coincided with the emergence of 
minimalism from the States and that that captivated me and a number of other students and we started to take an interest in that and that seemed to me to be a way forward and and the idea of the flat so the creation of a completely new something completely new or completely other to the strands and forming well, so something that yeah maybe i mean i i mean i would have had to have felt extremely confident to claim doing Not something claim, highly yeah. original which yeah. i don't think i was but um i certainly subscribe to the idea that um the the sort of radicalism of minimalism and constructivism from the Soviet Union was something that was um, that had a coherence within what was going on in 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 amongst student politics at the time, and uh, so I started to simplify my images, and they became abstract, I suppose, and. I had a close group of friends who were similarly interested, and particularly a, an ethnic Chinese student from Indonesia who was really a, a Maoist at the time. And, and he, I learned a lot from him in that respect, but also a sensitivity, or well, sensibility rather, to um, the use of very s s pared down painting and the use of very subtle use of colour and design and that sort of stuck with me and it has it ever since now, there's there's quite a hiatus between that and my uh, uh, and my sort of more later career as an artist because i had to you know ultimately had to make a living i first of all worked in the film industry and then later in teaching and i saw teaching as a a kind of way of justifying um, my being in as much as I could, I thought. Well, you, held, you held some fairly senior academic posts, I mean. Yeah, I did later. I mean, first of all, I started teaching in schools and, and uh, I did hold posts in schools, but um, I did genuinely believe um, that, that art was important in the curriculum. Yeah. Um, that you could you could help kids do things achieve things find a sense of agency for themselves through making art and that was an abiding kind of principle that i used um i think, I think it's a my, very sorry i think it's a very important one especially for children who aren't and for adults who aren't so easily literate i think it, it yeah, is very yeah, important yeah i think you're right yeah um i mean there are so many kids who I came across who, whose self-esteem, whose sense of achievement was changed quite profoundly because they found that they weren't being judged when they make up when they made art. They could do something that was valid for them, you know. I've also um, had friends who've worked in in prisons delivering arts classes, and mm -hmm. um, and it was a huge loss when they were cut in the nineteen nineties because. Uh, the the level of illiteracy in British prisons is very very high. There's such a high correlation mm. between prison term and and literacy, and you could not get prisoners to go into a writing class or a numeracy class, but you could get them to go into a classroom environment to do ceramics or yeah. To do yeah. painting and drawing. Yeah, and it was yeah. the first step in getting people's confidence, as you said, to engage. Yeah in those processes and from there on they would then go and find that they could read and write and do yeah, yeah. massively important for confidence so um there was this hiatus where i was teaching in schools and then i i when i was in my well, i think i was 40 at the age of 40 i i was really getting um very critical of the institutions of schools and the way they worked and and I sort of started to have my doubts about whether I you know could continue in within that system and a coincidence of events happened I started um, going to life classes at um, the studios that had just been established in Manchester by a group of Manchester 
fine art graduates, they called it Manchester Artist Studio Association, Massa. And I, I used to go to workshops, painting workshops, um, and life drawing and so on, just to retrieve, you know, uh, my doing, yeah, doing, doing stuff. skills, yeah. That led to um, printmaking workshops. It led to meeting a guy called Jeff Brunel, who ran the print department at Manchester Poly at the time. And he said to me, um, he said, what you're trying to do, you can't do in an evening class. You need to do it seriously. I said, OK. So he said, well, why don't you come and do an MA with me? And I said, OK. So that's what I did. I gave up my teaching and uh, went and did this MA. And that, too, was pretty cathartic, uh, you know, doing it as a mature student. And um, I, uh, yeah, I met um, one of the other lecturers, a guy called David Sweet, who was quite influential, who was a big protagonist of modernist abstraction. And uh, I found myself being quite profoundly um, uh, affected by the things that he talked about. And uh, it, it kind of reawakened the stuff that I discovered as a student in, in Berlin. And that kind of was the beginning of, of the journey that um, I've been pursuing since. So, so there is a kind of thread, if you like, that goes from political engagement and being in Berlin and to later studying and then on to where I am now. But, uh, you know, the, there was another hiatus of that involved teaching, this time in higher education, although it wasn't, it, you know, the teaching was closer in a sense to my practice than, than it had been previously when I was teaching in schools. And then 11 years ago, I retired from teaching and vowed that that's what I was going to do. In fact, <laughs> funny little anecdote, I'd um, been asked in my final year at the university to commission a sort of legacy works of art for a new building at the university and um, you know, did, went through this selection process and uh, awarded the commission to two artists. One was Susan Stockwell, who made a, a piece for the interior of the university, a mass, massive map of the world made out of recycled computer components, and a piece for the outside, an external piece, a uh, piece of abstract sculpture by an artist called Cedric Christie. And he and I became quite good friends. And he 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 asked me, you know, he said, he I understand you're retiring. And he said, what, what are you going to do? And it was what it was the one question I really hated or dreaded. Because <laughs> yeah, I didn't have an allotment at the time. I didn't have grandchildren. <laughs> and I wasn't interested in golf or any of those things. Yeah. So <laughs> I said, well, look, the thing is, I really want to get back to being an artist. He said, well, he says, you're not you're not retiring and now you're just changing jobs and it's kind of been like that you know um you know in that well you still carried on as an external examiner past yeah i still well. i still do i still do yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah so you are um, still and interestingly i think you, your sculpture with cedric was installed the, the week of my graduation Oh, really? my masters at that same university okay oh yes okay yeah so you saw it i can remember meeting you there as you were installing it actually oh, okay. yes i do yeah so um yeah and having a proper studio like we did in bedford and um you know being able to focus on work sort of refines your one's ideas you know and um we also produce a lot of rubbish, which I did. But I have been involved in a lot of really interesting projects, largely through Cedric introducing me to people and inviting me in to join various, you know, artistic circles and so on. And um, I suppose, you know, out of that um, I, has evolved my current practice, which. Um, I'm happy to talk about. 
Yeah, you know? I mean, that would be great. I mean, I, I think... I, my question uh, was, why still the abstraction and, and, and that continuity? Yeah, I suppose I it's, it's part, you, of the answer, you, part of the answer to that. It's kind of what I know. It's what I feel. It's what I sense is close to me. It's what I'm interested in. It's um, It's a sort of seems to me the idea of the process of painting the 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 effect and impact of color is fundamental to painting now i know that um you know that the art is you know making art is is quite a hybrid sort of activity it involves many more things and the old um traditions of painting and sculpture as as yeah we understood it when I first went to art school. So uh, fortunately though, um, the world of art embraces all sorts of practices and, and although some uh, may have a sort of great prevalence, if you like, in terms of um, controversy and grabbing attention, the uh, idea of painting is still highly relevant there are still yes. painters who make very original work and do scintillating things with with painting you know and uh, that's the niche or place that i i see myself in and um i i, I suppose my context is other abstract painters um you know the, there are uh, artists i mean there's um an organization called saturation point which i've written for that promotes this idea of um pared down abstraction so that you know there's a, a, a number of artists that are associated with that um there's there are artists around apt studios in greenwich that that i, I could identify with and of course the there are artists still in America that um, that I find still highly relevant. Yeah. An artist called Susan F Susan Frecon, who, who an American painter who I I kind of admire, you know. So so there is, I feel, still um, a relevance for abstraction. And and although you know, I'm not if you and if, if you if you find an, a, a parallel with literature, I'm not going to write a, a, a big novel, but I might, my aspirations are really to create a kind of poetry, if you like, with, with, with painting. And, and yeah. in fact, you know, the idea of, um, through the use of process, through the use of color orchestrations, so the sort of placement and so on, I, I would really like to invoke well, there's an visual there's poetry. Yeah, there's an element of haiku that could be linked to abstraction in certain certain ways, very clearly. An element of haiku. Oh, haiku. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, yes, and the, it, the simplicity and, of a haiku poem that has so much more to it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, a, and a, a very pared down structure again, but still a, a structure that relates, still quite a formal structure. Um, and and I guess I mean when I start when we started discussing the show, we were talking. I was talking about twenty uh, first century minimalist British painting, but actually it's very post minimalist. It's yeah. it's freer. It, it's part of a, a much freer, um, less regulated form. Yeah. But within that, it still has um, a very formal set of well, a very formal lexicon. I guess is the word that you'd use. I think that's true. I think, I think that's true. Um, I remember you know, uh, uh, the artist Sean Scully saying that, um, you know, his painting is, is not minimalism, but it is of minimalism. And I, I can entirely understand that position. I mean, I find myself inventing kind of parameters or rules for what I do. So um i you know you you've alluded to me using rectangular um shapes and and that really is to do with uh dividing up the canvas 
um, in in reference to the canvas itself, because obviously you still use a rectangular support most of yeah, the time. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I suppose that comes from uh, a, a years and years of looking at other paintings. And I mean, I've in other conversations we've had, I've mentioned to you, um, Piero della Francesca that I became interested in as an artist, you know, in my teens when when I first encountered a reproduction of his painting at school. Um, and I just like the, the the structure of it um, and, and, you know, the nativity is a painting I always go to look at in the National Gallery when it's there. It wasn't there. Oh, was I mean, it. But yeah, it's um, it, the, the, the rectangular thing comes about through divisions and I think and I suppose it ultimately traces back to the idea of the grid um, although um, you know uh, a grid isn't although they were fashion the idea of using a grid in painting was quite fashionable in the 60s it's not something I've really ever used um, uh, uh, again it's often a teaching device it but is. Even then I'd use it very sparingly teaching yeah yeah um, so I find myself inventing these sort of rules. So um, I find it very difficult to have cur you know, you know, introduce curves because they would start to mean something, I suppose, something else other than painting. And, and, and so that, uh, that, that's difficult. Now, you know, an artist that I really admire is Ellsworth Kelly. And I just find it, you know, his, the, the way he introduces curves I find quite fascinating, but then he makes, you know, his paintings are almost objects, sometimes curved objects, and they work. Um, but well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very interested in this from the piece, the initial piece of writing that I did about uh, post minimalism and minimalism for, as the introduction to yours and Deb's shows. There's this very formal avoidance of um, uh, natural and organic forms. And, and the one shape that uh, straddles both organic and inorganic or geometric forms is the circle. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the circle could arguably be a very organic form, the cell, the, you yeah. know, the planets, yeah. the cells. There is that yet um, it, it is also a form, you know, a target or a circle is used, obviously, very formally in abstractions at times, but not as much as... The, the grid and the square and the That's circle. True. Yeah. And there is this uncomfortable, this, so for me, I'm kind of aware that if I see a circle in abstract or in minimalist art, certainly I'm like thinking, well, that's an organic form actually. Yeah, uh, I mean, there are, there are artists who've used it, you know, very successfully, um, Kenneth Noland, uh, Robert Mangold. Um, so um, it, for me, it, often it, you know, you, place a circle in the canvas and it leaves some things in the corner that, and I not quite worked out what to do with those you know whereas you know if you divide something up and you there's a small space in the corner there's always and in fact a lot of my painting relies on that the sort of edges that are left and those ed those edges have a slightly Fibonacci hint about them or a slightly fractal hint Certainly Fibonacci, yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, the the proportions of my canvases are often worked out according to the Fibonacci sequence. Are they? So yeah. that's deliberate within the, the rule. Yeah, yeah, I wanted yeah, to yeah. know what your rules were. Well, yeah, that might be one of them. Um, uh, so yeah, the, 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 I was just, just finishing that thought. So the All idea right. of things being smaller, Things being left on the edges, I I exploit that, and you know often I will use a, a more intense color on the edges, balanced against a more neutral color in the center. Not always, but often. And so there's that painting in the red um, gallery, the blue on blue with the yeah. very intense blue on on the left hand edge, balanced against the other blues and the darker tones in the rest of the painting. And I quite like that using asymmetry to but balance. 
So. Well, uh, and I guess asymmetry are both part is part of the golden wreck uh, of the golden rule, or the, or yeah. Yeah, as well as the Fibonacci. Yeah. Because, uh, and asymmetry, if you have symmetry, it's static. Asymmetry causes movement. So there's always a movement in the yeah. name. Yeah, it does. You sort of veer from the center to the edge and back mm. or around and so on. So all the paintings in the show have have to in some degree got that, you know, there's a sort of a kind of center which um, uh, has a presence, if you like, an imminence. And then it's there's a sort of distraction on the edges. It's often a little bit like, um, you know, when you're going down the street. What I was going to, the word I was going to use was peripheral vision. There's something yeah, exactly. that plays. You, you, that... You, you, you're, you're going down the street, you're fixed on looking at what's in front, and suddenly you notice something. Yeah. And it's on the edge of your vision often, and, and you you kind of pick it up, and and it there's there's, a, there's something of that in in definitely having spent time in the spaces with them, there's mm. a lot of that 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 there is a, a central a, an expansive center that draws you in, but then there are these peripheral visual which are often in complementaries, mm. and so then create after images, and one of one of the most interesting things was obviously I took the risk of keeping one of the rooms red, um, despite having agreed to put it as a neutral colour. But I find that the after images on the red are mm -hmm. particularly different as with the peripheral smaller rectangles than on the white, which has oh, been a very interesting visual experience to see that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, you're really optically playing with very fundamental visual cues. Yeah. I must admit, uh, you know, I was a bit worried about um, the red and how things would work, but actually, I think it, they work. They, they, it, they kind of augment the paintings in a way that I didn't expect. So the blue on blue for me, it kind of looms out of the wall. Yeah. And, and I, I rather like that. The other painting on the opposite side, the, the the two, there's a sort of yellowy colour at the bottom. Yes. And um, a greeny colour top right. And, and they have different relationships with the red, as well as a relationship with the... Very different formal spatial spatial relationship with the viewer as well. Yes. And I, I, I like that. You know, I, I, that's a kind of added bonus to showing that you know on the i'm very way. happy with how it goes from white space to red space to white space to red space and yeah. and you yeah. have that right. visually no, I, am. I am too as it goes through but it, it was a risk that i well, and, and i really wanted you to talk a little bit more about color as structure because i know obviously uh matisse's red room is one of your favorite yeah pieces and and you use that as an example to explain um using color to structure to, to create formal structure with painting but yeah. I think a lot of people aren't so familiar with the idea of colour as structure. Certainly they are in architecture, so in architecture it's a very familiar yeah. dialogue. But okay, I, think I, suppose, I suppose what um, made me aware of this was a show that I was asked to write a review of at the last minute. It was, it was the last weekend of the show at uh, the Riverside Studios called Colour Structure. And I went to see the show and although I liked the show and I started to write something, I couldn't finish it. Um, and, and I abandoned the review, unfortunately, but it did get me to thinking about, I suppose yeah, one of the reasons I, did, I, I kind of abandoned it is, was because one of the artists what was, I won't say who it was, but one of the artists was clearly had a focus on using colour as structure. I felt the other artists uh, just had a kind of design structure that had- So an colour. arrangement of colour rather than a structure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I found it difficult to then articulate some ideas around that. When I started writing the review, I started talking about um, Matisse and, and the Red Studio, because I think for me, that is a, a painting that really epitomizes the notion of color as structure. I mean, Matisse was a master at orchestrating color and, and uh, using color to structure his, his, his paintings. 
And um, yeah, I have seen that painting in, in New York. Uh, it's it's yeah. a, quite a massive painting. And what you realize is that it's very thinly painted onto this, very close to the canvas. And you think, how did he do that without building up layers and layers of color? And, um, you know, and it's, so it, it's, it looks really fresh. You know? Yeah. The whole painting is really fresh. And it's, um, it, it, it's predominantly red, as you know, but all the reds are not all even. They're not evenly spread. There's very subtle nuances of red within the whole expanse of the painting. And then the, the it, drawing in the painting is crucial, but the drawing is created by leaving very slight gaps between one area of red and another, which shows allows an underpainting which changes throughout the painting to show through. As well as the canvas to show through. Yes, so, so um, <laughs> the drawing sort of holds it together, if you like. But then you've got... Um, you think negative space to draw within the colour. Yeah. So what you've then got is a whole series of things that are in the studio that, you know, other paintings, objects, um, furniture, and so on, that Matisse uses to bounce off the red. So he'll use, I mean, if you think of the colour wheel, yeah. you've, got, you've got red and you've got colours that have an affinity with red. So pink moving towards um, a mauve on one side and uh, orange, orange moving towards a yellow. Um, a yellow on the other side. So you, if you look at the painting, there are these cold reds, pinks, oranges, and so on that, are, that, that your eye moves to in this red room. But you've also got the opposite of red, which are greens, and you've got, which come in the form of plants and things like that. So you've got greens and they tend towards blue on the one hand and towards yellow on the other. Yeah. And then you've got, you've got um, I think there's some blacks in there as well, which are sort of neutral and, and a couple of other colors. So for me, that painting is what I would say was yeah, really successful in um, structural color. A, a color, color as structure for the painting. Okay, it's just, it sort of orchestrates color. It it it. Um, well, it, it structures the painting. Yeah, it, it is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So and you you don't use black yourself. I know you just mentioned black. In no, I use work. I use well. I suppose um, pure unadulterated black can be can go quite dead. Um, I tend to use indigo, which is. It, it, it's a very dark, dark, dark blue, um, but it can appear to be black. But the thing about it is, because it has this blueness to it, it doesn't. It still holds color, so it can it can re, it can relate to. Well, it reflects light differently. It doesn't absorb yeah, light it, in the same and it way. It can relate to other colors. Now, often I'll use it painted over another colour. So it might be painted over violet, which gives it, depending on the consistency of the, the indigo that I use, the, the underpainting will come through yeah. to a greater or, or lesser degree. I love uh, that you don't use black. I don't use black, but I use a mix of a burnt sienna and a thalo blue to create my dark. Yes, yeah, that's that's another way of doing it. I've, I've done that, but I'm not not for a long time now, um, but yeah, I, I can't remember. How did I discover using black? I can't remember now, but it, 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 sorry, I meant disco discovering using indigo. It just seemed to, yeah. And and also at the same, oh, yeah, the other colors I use are often earth colors. And that, that came about because, um, about three, three, four years ago, I invited to uh, with two other artists, Jeff Brunel and Martin Barrett, to have a show there. Um, 
the my attitude to the show was that um, I wanted to sort of think about um, what what might be appropriate for the space. Now, in the space, there were some there, there were the vestiges or remnants of some old fresco painting, which is unusual for Britain. Kind of, yeah. They didn't really survive, and they were sort of scenes. Uh, the pictures were of scenes around, you know, um, uh, barking, which was, you know, it was barking creek, so it's a, a, a sort of watery kind of landscape. And it struck me that the the colours were very much would have been earth colours. So I thought oh, that's interesting, and, and I started looking at getting earth pigments. The other thing was that. Um, uh, yeah, in talking to Tamara, who who ran the place, um, the sort of artists, apart from you know carvings or things like that, the kind of um, artist object, art objects that might have been in the space were would have, might have been tapestries. So I thought of the idea of using something fabric based. So. Yeah. I made um, some hangings to go in there, which related actually to some experiments with watercolor that I'd done during a residency in in Germany um, a year or so previous to that. So the way I worked was I got large sheets of uh, calico and cotton duck and I stained them by mixing an acrylic medium with with this pigment and really drenching the fabric in 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 those pigments and then arranging them on the floor and fiddling around and and then hanging them so they they sort of hang down um they they sort of have a top edge that's I'm, I'm seeing them they look rather kimono like they have a, a fabric yeah, they, quality. yeah they're, they're sort of irregularly shaped anyway yeah. it, 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 the point being that it they introduced me to using uh, pigments that came from uh, earth colors and what i discovered was you can get some astonishingly resonant colors you know some of the red oxides and yellow oxides are, are really quite quite remarkably bright you know well I, I know that you make your own both aquarelle uh, a sort of gouache and oil paint so so is that when you started to make it seriously or have how long have you painted well, i started own? making watercolors before that because um i found that buying the sort of small pans of watercolors never gave me intense enough color to do cover larger areas of paper that I wanted to use. So I started making my own with um, gum arabic and glycerine and sugar, uh, which there's a recipe that you I can... might ask you to send some recipes for the website, actually. That would be great to have a okay. recipe. Yeah, well, they, they all came out of a book by Jonathan Stevenson about okay. arts, artist techniques. So yeah, I, I, I um, and then, the current set of paintings sort of came out of that in a way. I had a show in Deptford in 2019 that, that um, you know, I reverted to using oil paint on canvas, but I was using the, um, uh, the, the, a lot of these earth colors. And in looking, you know, in buying pigments, um, I found other pigments that aren't necessarily earth colors, but they're, they're gave me colors that you, you wouldn't normally buy in tubes so so for instance there's a, a range of ultramarine colors that give you not only blue but pinks and reds and purples and i found those quite interesting so i've used a number of those in the i remember painting. your exhibition in the hat factory had quite a few mauves and purples yeah in that as well yeah, yeah. whereas this exhibition has a lot more blues and yellows the emphasis overall yeah. may could be considered to be blue and yellow yeah. although i know there's a lot of violet and red yeah. under, and pink underpainting yeah I, I use underpainting a lot so there's a um it was interesting when um we took the 
Sarah's students around virtually around the show and one of them said oh is that gold and I yeah, yeah, said, yeah. no actually it's it's a it's a terra vert an earth green painted over pink which and I find that quite interesting to do when you use underpainting of a kind of complementary colour. So, you know, pink under a, a, an earth green is the, the two sort of complementaries and you get an optical mix, if you like, of colours. Well, again, or, it's very interesting talking about colour as structure from in a fine art point of view, as opposed to a biochemistry point of view, mm. because obviously pure colour Mm. It's the structure of, you know, it's not a surface thing. It's an intrinsic uh, quality of the pigment. It is structurally that colour. And then it goes back another level into quantum physics. And you also <laughs> have colour, structural colour there. So when you are overlaying one colour structure onto another, it does then create a completely different it does. Uh, in it does. all, but in all those levels, in the quantum, in the biochemical, and in the visual. And strangely enough, um, you know, you, you, it's different if you if you use a, a very thin glaze of one color over another. It's, it's different from one color completely covering the other. You still get a modification of that top color. From but that's because the, the structure of the glaze. Is, yeah. is 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 yeah. compromised yeah i mean it's not it's not something new i mean hmm. constable used to paint on a terracotta ground which was obviously the 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 a red being the complement to the all the greens he used the gray greens i mean he never used a bright green if you look carefully his, yeah, yeah, his yeah. greens are sort of very Browns and very uh, gray green but yet they have a sort of resonance that comes off this this terracotta underpainting that and that again is a different way of structuring the painting with color and it your is, underpainting yeah. is 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 very much part of that yeah so. i mean i wouldn't want to claim that you know that my paintings are entirely just the structure of color as i sort of see in matisse because there is um, a degree of structuring through design yeah, uh, and I'm and I'm actually very interested in the idea of the the the, the sort of gamut between um, design as structure and process of painting and the sort of things that can be yeah happen in between. So, for instance, you know, uh, Kalaminis, who uses a very simple design structure relies really on a, a, a process of applying paint and taking it off and the sort of um, arbitrary things that happen when you paint one colour over another and then start stripping away what's there and you get these other derivatives. It's actually a very classic Renaissance technique for creating depth uh, as well. So. Yeah. The removal, especially with figurative painting, I'm trying to think of, of a really good example. Um, but you, you, if you paint on and then you paint the figure and then scrape off the background with an uh, umber or an ochre, if you look at, a, I'm trying to think, but maybe even a Raphael, something like that, uh -huh. lots of those are scraped back. So yeah. you, you start to see the canvas again in the background. Okay. I mean, I use, sometimes use a similar sort of thing in as much as I'll, um, paint something over some underpainting and then get a sheet of newspaper and rub it down over the top and then strip it off and then repaint it, which means that uh, using a lighter touch of brush, you know, so, I mean, they, it was a technique in, um, that was invented by the Slade professor, Henry Tonks, and um, they call it tonking, which is, to, you know, stripping paint off with with newspaper um uh, so yeah i do that sometimes and i more drastic than that i also um you know in an area of paintings not working i will take paint stripper to it and get yeah. it right right back down to the canvas yeah uh reprime that area and start again you know because um 
And that yeah. is a very structural thing to do. <laughs> that's, that's... It is. <laughs> it's a bit, <laughs> a bit edgy, but because um, you can lose the whole painting like that. But yeah, I do do, do that sometimes. So uh, yeah, it kind of leads on to the, uh, your other question about the choice of colour. Um, I think you've spotted the fact that, um, you know, there seem to be colour themes in some of the shows I've done, mm. sort of pinks and mauves and so on, and then blues and stuff. I, I suppose um, uh, for, the, for this show, yellow has been something that, a colour that I've sort of come to uh, be brave enough to use. It's quite a difficult colour to use is yellow, you know, because it does, yeah. it's, it's very, uh, tonally it's very light. And um, so it, it, uh, it can be a challenge and um but i found you know working with it actually very interesting you know so and then green is another one um mm. I, i've not used a lot of green before um but I, and you'll notice there are there are greens in this yeah. current set of paintings and they're different so there's a sort of um a sort of cobalty green there's a kind of um, they're probably the most varied of all the colours, actually. Yeah, yeah. So there's a sort of, um, I use a pigment called malachite, which is a copper, a copper salt, yeah. um, and it's what I found was actually was when you buy it from a paint supplier, it's very expensive. But if you if you buy it from from a chemical source, it's actually quite <laughs> cheap. I think it's copper carbonate or something. Yes. Like that, you know, yeah. 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 But it's um it's an interesting colour, and then there are those lovely green earth colours like Verona green earth and and so on, and I mix those sometimes. Um, and, and also coming into your exhibition smells wonderful because you've used lavender oil. I have, yeah. Um, it's I've, I've, sometimes you know you 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 make a painting because they depend a lot on surface. Um, sometimes paint can go dead it can go flat and you think why has that happened and it's to do with you know fat on lean and the old you know the old art school thing about <laughs> starting off lean and getting it more fat um, and of course you try to cut corners and things go wrong but i found with lavender oil um, it's quite expensive to use but it does have a it does have a kind of an oil a slight oiliness to it and so I've been using that and I and I sometimes use a secative yeah. to help with the drying because I get I get impatient with um, the underpainting it needs to dry so I can start moving on and um and I discovered that the the lavender oil gives quite a nice finish to 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 the to the, to the paint it's so, beautiful finish it's a beautiful yeah. finish and so the drying it the drying is interesting. This summer for the Demelazine exhibition, I've been mixing with linseed and almond oil oh, and right. really layering up those big paintings. Yeah. And I had to take them out, had to chance it, mm. take them up into the garden and put them in 40 degree sunlight and really right. hope that the whites underneath weren't yeah. completely frazzled. Did the, did the surface not wrinkle up? No, I had to be really careful. They were only out for like half an hour. Yeah, just to try and push that drying time because yeah. they weren't actually dry for exhibition. I uh, sometimes, um, you know, rubbed oil, uh, rubbed linseed oil into the surface of the colour just to try and bring it back uh, if I find it's gone a bit flat, and that yeah. sometimes works. You know, I don't like particularly using <laughs> varnishes, but um, but but just the only varnish I really like is good old fashioned yacht varnish. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, my I, favorite. I, I, I haven't gone that far. <laughs> don't tell any, don't tell anybody I ever said that out loud. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I also wanted to know about the three D, the reliefs, oh, because yes. both both you and Deb have these much. Well, they're not much smaller, but they are small scale rectangular reliefs that then yeah. focus on. Um, they're still very uh, cuboid. And rectangular. Mm. Mm. Where does that come from? Where does well, that, that need to take the well, surface into three dimensions come it, from? Quite fortuitous, really. And it was a sort of 
quite a playful thing in a way. Um, you know, I work often as with collage watercolor paper. I yeah. cut, it, cut it up and arrange it and then fiddle around with. Um, when you were here last time, my whole kitchen was covered, the whole floor downstairs was covered with drying. Uh, yeah. Your wonderful, wonderful homemade gouache things that uh, I could yeah. eat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I could eat them. When, when I, when I, yeah, when I took them back on the Eurostar, they went through the x ray. <laughs> and, and the bloke said to me, What are those little square things you've got in your, <laughs> in your baggage? I said, Oh, I thought he meant something else because I bought some soap in the corner shop there. And I said, oh, c'est le savon. He said, oh, OK. <laughs> well, they didn't look. And they didn't look, no. Oh, my word. Anyway, um, where were we? Uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, they were the, those shape pieces. They were sort of quite playful in a sense. Um, as I said, I've been doing these collage things that had the kimono wing bits on the edges, which um was what i was playing with and somebody was unpacking some ikea furniture one time and these bits of shaped sort of honeycomb yeah cardboard fell out and i thought oh, they look interesting so i kept them kept them for a long time and then um i sort of stuck them back to back and they had the similar sort of shape as some of the collages i i, I made but they, they didn't really have the surface I could paint on. So I got some very thin ply, two millimeter ply or even thinner and just clad the things with, with, with plywood. From well, the they're water. beautifully clad. I mean, they're precision clad. Yeah, well. But saying you clad them, it gives the, the impression that they're, they're kind of stuck on bits of wood, but they actually look like beautifully yeah, clad. Yeah, they're cut with a, steel rule and scalpel yeah and they're very precise objects that there's no imprecision in the finished surface and then just painted with gesso and rubbed down you know and and then um painted on them i've, I've made about six or seven of those i've given a number away as wedding presents and other sort of presents you know um and uh and there are a couple left for for the show. Well, I really like the fact that Fox spotted the, the connection with Malievich and his cutouts okay. in the way yeah. that it was there as well. That was interesting to me that there is that yeah. reference back. And I know some of your work from Venice has a Malievich reference as yeah, well. Yeah, that's, that's, that was, yes, I, I agree. That Venice show, I think, you know, as I explained before, came, was an illusion, a, a very deliberate allusion to Malevich because it it was shown at the same time as the 2013 yeah. Venice Biennale where the theme was the encyclopedic palace and that for me it was all to do with artistic knowledge and um and what uh, um uh, you know what could be part of artistic knowledge and I thought certainly um those seminal pieces by Malevich were important as 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 a paradigm yeah. within artistic knowledge, and then the use of those similar principles in the emergence of minimalism was for me another paradigm, and I wanted to allude to that. So it was, so they were there are allusions to Malevich to Donald Judd and uh, very. But they also thing. they are a little with the gilt and the red. They're little icons as well. They are like little Catholic icons yeah. on that scale. Well, that that one came from a different show, but it did have a follow-on from yeah. the first show. But yes, you're, you're right. So there are the illusions in that piece, the fallen angel, are, are sort of really to do with Venetian painting, I mm. suppose, you know, religious painting and particularly, you know, the art of Bellini and Tintoretto. Um, I did want to ask about that because obviously there's an art historical feed into your painting and also but I did want to ask if there is a spiritual content to your work a, a deliberate or a, an overt there was nothing is overt I suppose but it's, it's funny you should ask that because I'm not 
I'm not a religious person, but then spirituality isn't necessarily to do with religion. Um, I was showing somebody um, on Sunday uh, who uh, uh, pictures from the show, and he's a, a practicing Buddhist, and he was very interested in in the pictures and said said to me, oh, these have a, quite a powerful spiritual quality to them, which I I rather welcomed as a as a as a perception of the painting or as a, as a response to them because. Um, the, the had, I suppose, yeah, I would like the paintings to have um, a quality of, or invite co contemplation of them in, if you like, in a meditative way. Mm. And if that gets, you know, if that's an access to a sort of spiritual aspect, then I'm very happy with that. But it's, it's, um, you know, I wouldn't presume to say, oh, these are spiritual paintings, but I, I, I really welcome the fact that somebody responds in that has, way. Has seen that in, in those paintings. <laughs> so, so yeah. They're, they're, they're... Well, contemplation in itself is fundamental to most um, religious practices. Yes. Yeah. And it's an interesting mode because in... Uh, Currently, we kind of value concentration over contemplation. And um, there needs to be a balance between the two. Yeah. And I think your work clearly holds that balance, which would be a Gavoric ascetic concentration, contemplation, expansion, contraction, balance within. Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> I agree. So, yeah, uh, I mean, as opposed to some of the things I was faced with as a student, you know, where there was a sort of request, if you like, for art to be didactic or yeah. uh, overtly political, which I found I couldn't do. I, I was not, I didn't, A, I didn't think it was, could adequately do that. That was far better done by photography and film. Um, um, yeah, I, I think there's, I think always with figuration, there is that, there's a, there's a battle that yeah. you have with that. In that fact, it, just as an aside, uh, some years ago, I went back to Berlin and looked through archives in the library to see if there was a correlation between those political events so shortly after 1968 into the 70s as to whether there had been an impact on what artists did. And I couldn't find any. I couldn't really find couldn't. any? No. There, I mean, there were... Um, uh, there were a couple of artists who there's a painting called Cafe Deutschland uh, by um, I can't remember his name now, an, an artist who was at the art school at the time. And it's quite a big epic painting. And it's it is a sort of cafe scene with all the sort of characters in it. So Rudi Dutschke and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, but that sort of narrative storytelling I just wasn't interested in. Well it's I mean, very interesting because again what you're saying there there's such a difference between portraiture and narrative yeah. painting. Yeah yeah. Even though they would seem to be similar there there's something very yeah. very different in their didactic approach. Yeah. One is reflective and one is active. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the, only, the only artist who well there are two artists that did pick up on on um, the sort of politics of the time. One was Sigmar Polke and the other Gerhard Richter. Yeah. Now, the, the Gerhard Richter um, made a painting in 1988, which was um, about a big funeral of um, a student activist called Holger Mainz. And, but he painted it 10 years after the event mm. of the death of Holger Mainz, which is what the, and he took it from a press photograph, the painting. And it's a, about thousands of people attending this guy's funeral. And that, I suppose, is pretty overtly political. And then uh, Sigmar Polka painted a picture in which there was a black triangle painted in the top, I think it was the right hand corner. 
in which it says, and those above ordered a triangle to be painted. And it, that was an allusion to the sort of authoritarianism. So that kind of is a political. But again, text, text is yet another very interesting thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, coming. That is, is sort of why I think you know that spiritual thing non-narrative uh, for me is, is quite important um, yeah and I guess that um from the late 60s onwards when you have the Aji pop art for me the most successful forms are like Adrian Piper and where the gorilla girls and that kind of yeah. art but that's my personal it's yeah. a very personal yeah. kind of engagement with that and then the land art the the large pieces of conceptual land art which have then yeah. fed the kind of eco and sustainable art movement are possibly the most political works yeah. at the moment. But as you say, yeah. film, and been, film and photography have yeah. transformed yeah. What, what the potential use of medium uh, of politics. So. I mean, there was a, a student that was around. I only knew him. I didn't know him well, um, but he, be, he then be, went to the film academy, a guy called Harun Faroqi, and he was an early user of um, surveillance footage to make mm. very political work. I found, you know, and as, as I was saying, I think film, video, oh. photography can articulate political ideas in many ways, for me, better than painting, I won't say. Well, there's a different temporality. There's a different time association with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there are some very successful artists who, um, you know, Jeremy Deller, I think, is, is, does make some really powerful political statements with his art. Um, is it Keith Coventry as well? And uh, Well, are, things like know. Dismal Land. I mean, did you get to see Dismal Land with Jimmy Ooh, Corfield? Yes. Yeah. I didn't get to see it, but that was fabulous. It was terrific. Yeah, I yeah. went. I went. Fantastic. It really absorbed you. But it's not something I can do. So you have to no. No. you have to work with your limitations. Yeah. I guess, <laughs> what your predilections are. <laughs> well, work with our media, and we have a lot of different media. But as a, in a, as opposed to a hundred years ago, we have so many more media. Mm -hmm. at our disposal you do yeah and and our audience is so much more sophisticated mm. in its use of those mediums so possibly much as painting is more old-fashioned to use the term there are many more people who are much more competent in film and photography True. Than that. the balance of who can do what i would imagine a hundred years ago most people could draw to quite a a a, a, a good level yeah True. And handwriting was fabulous. Again, it, you know. We used to get taught it, didn't you? Exactly. And now a lot of people never draw and never write by yeah. hand. And sadly, really sadly, a lot of art students don't t get taught drawing. Oh, you know, you know how you turn up on a residency and it's a room full of people on Mac laptops. I mean, that's how it is. I'm, me included. Yeah. But it means there's a lot more filmmakers and photographers out there than there are painters, which is also an interesting, and that aspect of time, it takes mm. a long time to make a painting. It does, yeah. And I think people are still aware of the process of temporality within that object, whereas a photograph is a second. Yeah, so, although there are photographers that... Do time-lapse. That, that um, take time. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Jeff Wall. Um, oh, uh, not not I'm generalizing hugely, but I think the audience perception is that it's much quicker to take a photograph than paint yeah, a painting. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. there's an underlying subconscious yeah. awareness that people have. Yeah, agreed. And you, you, um, okay, shall we take a pause? Let's no, start to answer. Um, okay. so I shall welcome you back over a little pause in our conversation. Right, yes. And, uh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the, the fabrication process of your work. So okay. the process of preparation of uh, stretchers, choice of stretchers, materials, and the process of making them even before you start mm. to paint. Yeah. Well, uh, two things really, I suppose. One is that at some 
of the larger canvases and make the stretches myself with um you, you know uh, what would it be th th three by three by one and a half or something like that and um i i do lap joints on the corners um and i found you know i need to brace them as well in the middle sometimes depending on their size i put a cross brace in them and what's the maximum size that you work at well uh Probably maximum would be 1500, uh, sorry, 150 centimeters by maybe just over a meter. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the practical reasons for that, and that is transportation. Um, yes. The paintings that are in the show actually fit neatly in the back of my estate car. And I kind of, design them for that so that, that you know they would I could transport them easily and I'd quite like to go slightly larger than that I think but at the moment that's you know in terms of studio size and transportation um it's a the size I'm working on at the moment is sort of ideal and uh, something I learned from a, an artist called Alan Miller years ago is that um I use uh sort of door architraving which has got a curved profile on it and I screw those to the edges so that the, the canvas the lift. yeah it lifts the canvas from the um from the flat uh wood but it also gives a depth to, to the canvas so that the, the canvas sort of stands off off the wall I quite like to have that and then I stretch the um the canvas over that and I uh, I use both cotton duck, uh, sort of 10 ounce, 11 ounce cotton duck, because it's got a tighter weave than the cheaper nine ounce cotton yeah. duck. And I, if I can afford it, I use linen. Um, I mean, I, my preference would be linen because it's just got a nice, it's got a nicer tooth to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I use rabbit skin glue to size it. Um, and I did, I have been using um, quite an old recipe, which I actually learned at art school and then revived it, which is a what they call a half chalk ground or a half oil ground. It depends. You know, the Germans call it a, a half oil ground. The, we call it a half chalk ground. And basically what it is, is you make, you get a mixture of one to three. So three parts whiting and one part titanium white pigment and you mix that up put it in a little heap on a glass sheet and make a well in it and then you pour in um, uh, an amount of linseed stand oil which is a thickened uh, linseed oil and then pour in on top of that um, a solution of rabbit skin glue which is a, th a thinner version wow. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, of the stuff you size the the, um, the canvas with. Now, the reason for the, it, essentially, it's a gesso recipe, but gesso, which is just the, the chalk and pigment ground with um, rabbit skin glue, is okay for hard surfaces, but on a canvas, it's likely to crack. Yeah. So, so the linseed oil gives it a bit of pliability and it it's also, such a beautiful process to use those materials because yeah. it's so always yeah, to, tempting to use the the the, the pva equivalents to stop the yeah uh, so then um you mix all that together and it takes a while because the whole thing you know the, the the there's an emulsification process goes on where the, the 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 oil has to mix with the rabbit skin glue and it forms a kind of consistency of i suppose double cream um but it then will set. Now I also add a little bit of Dettol to it to stop mold growing. Yes, yes. Just a few, just a few drops. But um, and then to apply it, you I brush it on, but keep keep it warm so that the the, the rabbit skin glue doesn't set. It can be a bit of a pig because it it you know if you especially if you've got a large surface, you get an area drying quite quickly, and then the other area is still fluid. So you have really have to work 
quite oh, quickly so. and sometimes with warm water over it and so on but and then leave it for I mean people say you're supposed to leave it for six months but I don't um, but I do I don't paint on it immediately uh, or, and and the reason for doing that it is a very nice surface to paint on it's sort of the, the, when you paint oil paint on it it sort of bonds with the with this with the sub you know with the with the ground so um and do you sand it back before you start painting do you yeah i do, do, yeah, I do it sand back? it a bit get yeah, rid of any bits and pieces and yeah. fluffy bits of canvas that might stick up and whatever so yeah so that, that that's my preparation process and then as we discussed before you know i make um i work a lot with raw pigments and which is a similar process in a way i mix it with uh, linseed oil um, uh, into a, a constituency. I use a muller, you know, a, a sort of glass muller. Beautiful thing yeah. for themselves. Yeah, yeah no, they're beautiful for themselves. Yeah. Muller. I discovered they're actually quite expensive. I've had this one for years, but it's they're quite expensive now. So, you, and I find it's easy to use some pigments you can use just mixing them with a palette knife, but other pigments you really do have to mull the pressure. Them. They need to, they really need to absorb the oil to to, to work properly. Um, and it depends on the consistency that you want as to the amount of oil you put in uh, in with it. So, and do you find it's more expensive to buy the original pigment if you're making quantities, or is it better value to actually make the paint yourself? Uh, it's probably more expensive to buy the paint than the pigment. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I just, it, uh, there are some colours. I suppose you could buy all the colours that I use in, in tubes, but I don't see them yes there is quite interesting there are some colors that come as pigments i thought oh, that, that, that could be quite interesting so for instance there's a range of ultramarines now we always associate ultramarine with blue but actually they make an ultramarine red an ultramarine pink and an ultramarine violet and they're quite close but very but actually when you make the paint out of them they're very different uh, I quite like that range of colors they're they're, they're sort of can be quite cool reds and pinks yeah. so I quite like that and do you prepare the paint uh the choice of palette paint color before you start painting or do you mix I do it as I go, I do it as I go along often. so it's because, actually part of the process as you paint. yeah so uh, I mean yeah I might plan what the, the colors are going to be in a painting but when I actually come to use them they they might not work I remember one painting that's in the show I was working on it and I thought, oh God, that looks far too much like Aston Villa strip. You know, <laughs> I just kept having this, kept having this association, you know, and it was contemporary heraldry. Yeah, and I sort of had to, it, it was a real, yeah, real challenge to get away from that and, and do something that, you know, worked. Um, and I suppose that all the paintings are, have that challenge. I mean, they look quite simple and you think, well, I could do them quite quickly, but they take quite a while to do, to get the, the, the colour right, the surface right. Because as you know, I do, do a bit of, fair bit of underpainting, overpainting in, yes. in various constituencies, you know. So, and so the colour that mixes optically is quite important for me. You know, you get colours that you wouldn't be able to get out of a tube or mixed up they just are the way they are when and each one them. would be unique i guess with each mix that you make of yeah it. yeah that's true so um and what i found for instance is that you can so i use a lot of earth colors and so things like caput mortuum which is a sort of violety brown but if you paint it over violet it enriches that sense of that violetness but you get a violet that you wouldn't get anywhere else you yeah. know it's a sort of it's not brown it's not violet it's something else and it's got a it's got a richness to it and um, I try to um you know I'd, 
my paintings are not about color exercises, which would be quite easy. And um, I, they're about really trying to create some sort of poetry or magic between colors, you know, and um, I suppose and the that's... Yeah, and the over -layer, layering of them alters them structurally on a, on a level of uh, biochemical and pigment level as well. So yeah. it's a really fascinating alchemy that's going on. Yeah. On the canvas. Yeah. And the other the other thing I found with um, mixing the pigment is that uh, some areas of the paintings are quite thinly applied, so you get the light coming through from the white ground. Um, so I, I rarely use white in, in, I might sometimes use it, but I rarely use it. I sort of like to get, I like to use the white of the canvas to come through the Color to and, get and so then you build up in thin layers to get that luminosity yeah. and yeah, strength of yeah. color. Yeah. Hope, yes, it depends on how. It depends on, you know, how visible I want the brush marks to be, as and there's a sort of compromise to be made between that and the luminosity of the yeah. color that you want. You know, because I notice in some areas of the paintings in the exhibition, some are completely matte and completely yeah. light absorbent, and other you can see. The brushwork if you're yeah. up yeah. yeah yeah so and that then plays off against the, the surface of the painting it, whether it is matte or whether it is slightly glossy i tend not to favor glossiness i, I prefer a sort of satiny or matte finish depending on you know the, what where the color is located its area and so on you know, so. and there's also quite often a slight bleed between colors where you can see some of the underpainting yeah and that again creates a very interesting optical effect that you have a very very yeah um, well as as you know i don't I, now i wouldn't say i never use masking tape but very rarely um and so i tend to what i do is I stretch a piece of string between one edge and the other and then paint up against the the line that that creates and then work from the other side and yes it, it, it and sometimes you've got an underpainting where you paint up to the area that you want so it, the the underpainting goes underneath it yeah. so when you when you paint another color on top of that bit it, it does leave that bleed at the edge but sometimes that offers quite an interesting tension between one area of color and the other and the other thing it does it brings them up to the same spatial position yes. you're not you're not reading it oh this overlaps that yes. it's next to that and so yes. you read the space as the color not 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 a physical overlap um, yes so so all those sort I, of things yeah no i very much like that in my landscape painting especially yeah so that, a lot, all that goes on in my head while i'm doing the yes. paintings. I think a lot of people have no idea about the length of time it takes to actually make a painting. No, I don't think they do. They, think, they think that if it's simple, it's dead easy to do, but actually it isn't. It's probably, I mean, we're, you know, we visited Fox and um, his paintings are quite complex and there's a lot of painting required in his paintings because of all the different, I mean, they're figurative, so there's more painting involved and I kind of you know I had an admiration for that but his work's obviously very different from mine yeah. and I thought well are his paintings more difficult to make than mine and I think probably not no you know, it's a it's a different kind of effort and it's a different intentionality and yeah. I think that's another element also yeah. um that there's always the tension between intentionality and process and yeah, every artist has a yeah. different balance yeah. And that will change during the course of a painting. Yeah. All the time. So yeah. The, the process of a reflection also are so absent for many people from the process of painting. What when they're looking at them? Yeah, they have no yeah. comprehension that perhaps you've spent no. three weeks just looking at the painting and being with it, and but they're yeah. still at the same time mentally making evaluations and judgments and yeah. Uh, well, I'm very... interested in that idea of process, you know, and I, I think we've spoken before about this gamut between uh, what is process, i.e. the process of painting and the design of the painting. Uh, yeah. And um, in fact, yeah, I 
sort of toyed with the idea of curating a show called Between Process and Design. And it's Which it's a great uh, show. Uh, um, some for some people, the word process is about a systems based art. I don't mean that. I mean process as in you know processing the material and how the material behaves as a result of that process that's i mean yeah take an artist like callum innes um i think his paintings are heavily dependent on the process that he uses to make them their designs are very simple they're, they're usually and like so davenport's poor parrot paintings yeah, exactly yeah, skin yeah. paintings or, or alexis harding who yeah who uses paint with a lot of linseed oil, lets it dry, and then lets, uh, you know, lying them flat, and then lifts them up, and the paint slips, and he deliberately makes the paintings so that they yeah. will slip and and create distortions. That's his process. Um, there are, on the other hand, other artists who map everything out first and have a color scheme that they want to pursue, and um, and so. The, the result is i wouldn't say it's independent of process because it's not but there is there's a clearer design to it that um, and sometimes lies somewhere in the middle like mine where there is a design and there's also what happens with the process so um, as i say it's, it's an idea i've been toying with for a while but and um, maybe it will come to fruition i don't know <laughs> Well, I wanted to ask a bit more about your curation as well, because obviously yeah. both of us are artist curators, to use yeah. that like popular yeah. term. Um, and um, how, did you, how did you start? Well, um, uh, some years, well, a couple of decades ago, I was involved with um, Castlefield Gallery in Manchester. I was on their, on their board and I, I was very interesting. I mean, it's one of the first artist-led galleries outside of London, you know, established in the early 1980s. And by necessity, the artists had to be the curators because it was run with, on a very short budget. And the, the intention of the gallery was to invite artists that would not otherwise be shown in Manchester to, to show. And so they had to curate the shows themselves and the whole process was was you know a very interesting one it involved um, a decision about who we wanted to invite to show approaching the artist making studio visits uh, selecting work from the studio visit agreeing with the artist that, um, that 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 they wanted that work to be shown um, and then uh, you know sending a van to collect it and bring it to the gallery and then and then it was a bit of an awkward space i mean there was a large upstairs room and and a smaller downstairs gallery so the large upstairs room could take very large pieces of work downstairs less so so it was a question of getting you know getting the hang right but also uh, i mean when you're sort of thinking about curation in those terms you've got to think about a you know, an annual program, for instance, and what you're going to show and what show follows what and so on. So there's a, a, a range of interests and, and so on. And um, I suppose the, I got a little bit involved in that, that process, but because I wasn't one of the artists in the studio that did it, I was, my involvement was, was sort of peripheral, but in the early 2000s, um, digital imaging was becoming, probably even before that, but digital imaging and use of computers was uh, something of interest. And um, it, you know, often it was you know, creating work on a screen and then printing it out. And yeah. I wasn't really interested in that. I was more interested in artists who used computers in the process of making work and so I went I said you know made this proposal about uh, curating a show that involved uh, you know, digital media and, um, and then set about researching uh, artists that that used digital media and heard about 
five artists in the show and um looking back it was it was probably even though i say it myself it was quite a cutting edge show because it was it involved artists who programmed um routers to cut things into yeah. surfaces and print them as if they were woodcuts you know um it involved artists who created images digitally um it involved uh, uh, processing of existing images digitally you know so appropriating images and then adjusting them digitally and so on so it turned out to be quite new oh and one artist um constructed things in three dimensions virtual 3d and then actually made them so um, yeah. in in cast wax you know it was before digital printing so they had to be made you know using the the, the virtual 3d modeling as a sort of drawing if you like it turned out to be quite an interesting show i think you know and um, but so also, I, I know that you're a printmaker as well. Yeah. You brought me on to print. And um, because we haven't, um, I mean, obviously, I, I have a big printing press here and I hope you'll get to use it in the future. But um, how has print informed you? What is the relationship between print and painting in your work? Well, um, I did an MA in printmaking, yeah, it was, it was fine art. It, you know that was my fine art degree in printmaking and I, I did it because I wanted to learn an additional skill you know, about printmaking I was quite interested in etching really and and I got on the course I got interested in um, color multi-plate color etching and screen printing and that's really where the sort of my interest in abstraction returned and um, the interesting color and one of the one of the big connections for me between the printmaking and my painting is the, is the fact if you want to create colour with printmaking, you have to do it in layers. You know, you print, you know, with a multi-plate colour etching, you have to use at least two plates yeah. to, to get the colour mixes. But I learned techniques like, um, you know, viscosity printing, where you use the intaglio process which is rubbing the ink into the surface of the plate and then rolling over the plate as if it was a relief uh, with another color but if you if you have a uh, if you do that with an ink that has a higher oil content you can put a third color on the top which is has no oil so the difference in viscosity means that one area will reject the other so you get you get multiple colors and you get some quite interesting qualities with that and screen Thank printing you. obviously um you know printing one color over another is, is how that works but i did a lot of open screen screen printing so in other words painting on the screen and printing painting on the screen and printing. So effectively mono printing yeah well they they were screen. mono prints but yeah. they were probably more like paintings than, than prints in terms of their process. I, I, oh, um, for me, also, there's a precision in printmaking. Making. Yeah, um, there's, there's, there is a discipline that you need to keep to. Um, it's very different. It's a very different approach when you set up. Yeah. Well, yeah. for me, I find a very different headspace when I'm printing. I, I mm -hmm. subconsciously apply very different criteria into, into my work making process because it's the yeah, same materials yeah. there. So I, I, I mean, I, you know, since since having been in France a couple of weeks ago, I have thought about that printing press. And thought, oh, it'd be quite nice to make some woodcuts there, you know, yes. with um, which I think would work quite well with the paintings I'm I'm doing at the moment. It's particularly with you know the idea of overprinting and overlapping and and layers of color and so on. And I can of course use my pigments to do that because I can exactly. make own, yeah. I can make my own printing inks to do it which uh, could be could be interesting i think yeah i make mine from the soot from the fire and have a big vat uh -huh. yeah so sally there's a project for us <laughs> fantastic <laughs> yeah um yes so you, sorry, to, i knocked you off sideways to, from curation because of the printmaking yeah yeah just going back to the curation um yeah i did a couple of curation stints with castlefield i um 
curated an artist called Peter Seal, um, who's an abstract painter who's, who I admire. Um, and uh, then uh, more recently, I have a friend, Maxine Bristow, who completed a PhD. Um, she's a textile artist and a really good textile artist. Yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah. You know her work, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we've been good friends for probably 30 odd years now. And um, we were talking about her PhD and the idea of materiality and the, what the associations that materials can have with, particularly with textiles, um, where, you know, the sort of techniques of te textiles is often associated with the repetitive, boring, work that's been associated with women a lot you know cross stitching and needlepoint and embroidery and all those sort of things um but can be she has used those techniques to sort of quite powerful effect and they that materiality embodies with it that observation of of the the labor that women are in, often involved with that goes unnoticed and and it got me to thinking about um a that that i thought it would be great to show her work because she's 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 not the sort of person who will go and push her work but so I and i wanted to bring her in association with other artists as well who use materials in a different way so i put a proposal to Cross Lane Projects, which was a gallery that's been established in Kendall in Cumbria. And they, it was called Made With. And it was four artists using different materials and whether the focus of the, the work is on its, on its materiality and the way that material, um, you know, has its, has its impact. So Mark Woods, who makes these sort of fetishistic objects, um, uh, Maxine, sort of minimalist. Uh, a lot of her work is based on sort of furnishings and that kind of thing. Um, Sean, Kate Mooney, who works yeah. with often with uh, industrial materials like bitumen. Um, corrugated bitumen and industrial toweling and stuff like that and um Anna Fairchild who works with uh what's it jesmonite a sort of hardened form of plaster you know yes and resins and various and other so a lot of her work is to do with uh, the process of casting and the chances mm. that occur through through you know using casting as the main not not just casting an object, but using the casting process to create objects. If, if you see there's a, there's a difference. Yeah, I have, a, I have a piece of hers here. I bought, I really- Unfortunately, yeah. that um, show was, was a big, was a victim of, of the lockdown because uh, we'd no sooner set it up and lockdown happened. So I'm not sure it was seen in the way it, it needed to be seen really, because I thought it was quite a successful show. Yeah. I have other ideas for curation. Um, as I've said to you, I'd quite like to curate this. And I, the idea of, between process and design, there's a, there's a um, yeah. So I, I think the thing about curation is, as an artist, you can you can curate shows that about things that you wouldn't necessarily make work about yourself so it's yeah, a good way you can of explore other it's, it's ideas. a good way of exploring other ideas and other artists without necessarily having to to pursue those sort of things yourself and often you find that there is there is a sort of mutual benefit to to doing that you know something that will impact on your own work and you briefly uh, mentioned uh previously some of your favorite contemporary abstract painters yeah um oh uh, well i <clears throat> yeah I, I i could list them you know I, like sean scully i thought has was has been quite a um somebody i admire somebody i look at um 
Joseph Albers is somebody I look at, although he can be a bit sort of um, a bit too formalistic sometimes. But I think some of his colour relationships that he establishes are really interesting. Um, Callum Innes is, is another one. Um, I discovered a, an American artist called Susan Frecon, who um, also, I mean, these are artists who somehow belong or have come from the, uh, from minimalism, I suppose. I, I wouldn't and say that. They're not and minimalist Post minimalism artists. and abstraction. Yeah, they're, they're not. Very much so. Yeah. So Susan Frecon, she's, she seems to have been discovered late career, you know, and um, she's her, her paintings are very simple, often involve a simple single motif that she often she derives a lot from looking at other paintings, principally medieval painting. Um, and and she uses unusual colors. She too mm. works with pigments and earth colors and very interesting combinations a lot of reds a lot of earth reds so hematite and oxides and those uh, and earth colors but she does she does you know create some magic with her colors um, um who else uh, well there's you know artists from the 60s i suppose you know well i i, I love her. hoyland's work i mean i love hoyland. yeah well john hoyland of course, the maestro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just um, superb colour use. Yeah. And, and... Um, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I'm making notes as I go. Yeah, yeah John Hoyland, um, Kenneth Noland, Jules Olitsky from, from then, Frank Stella, you know, all those sort of... And I also tend to include Tess Jarry within that within the british canon as well with some of her abstract yes yeah, she, she, uh, and mally morris um, yeah who's another um really good very prolific very yeah. inventive um abstract artist you know and she's mally morris is an artist who i think is what somebody who I'd say really understands the process of painting because she, she works with acrylic but she understands you know, the transparency, the opacity, the luminosity, uh, that she she marries that with the quality of the mark and so on. So, I mean, she and really the scale did, of the and the scale yeah, of the image. And she really is an astoundingly accomplished <laughs> painter. Um, but yeah, she mentioned Tess Jarrett um, and her husband Mark Bow. They two are, are artists that um, one could, you know, you know. But then um, I'm beginning to discover. Artists like my co-exhibitor Deb Deb Cobble. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, I think her work's great. I'd love to do a two-person show with her. You know, mm. that'd be really good. It would be fabulous to do that. I'd, I'd love to do that. If um, you're listening, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's you know artists I've seen who are associated with that: Louise Blyton, Sean Stippling, um, there's Mark Sibley in. Yeah, love Mark's work. Yeah, Great Mark's work as well. So, yeah. And the other person I reference is uh, really pushing expanded painting in the UK in the last sort of two decades is Brendan Lyons, who's just curated a, uh, at Fact in Liverpool, and I, a really lovely show. Oh, okay. Um, and also, I then wanted to ask about your wider interests in so films, music, philosophers, literature. Those influences. Yeah, I. Yeah, I, I could talk about photography. Um, mm. While I was teaching, um, I didn't really have a studio and I did resort to photography for quite a while. I, I exhibited photographs and they were to do with, because I think um, at one point uh, my painting was, was, I could associate it a lot with the sort of imminence imminence as in the presence of um, the built environment, you know, yep. the, uh, the urban environment, architecture and so on. And I got quite interested in the idea of architectural spaces and the idea of, of um, 
non-space, non-place, you know, the sort of anonymous spaces that are created in cities that nobody seems to have any ownership of, but everybody moves through. And I yep. made a series of photographs of places like that. And I suppose the connection often was the sort of rather empty, minimalist sort of appearance of the photographs. And there are um, photographs, photographers rather, that um, I sort of look at who have that kind of deadpan emptiness. You know, people like Stephen Shaw and William Eggleston and Diana Arbus that are where there seems to be no pretense, no artifice, they're just photographs of what they see. And I, I, I you know. And I suppose Martin Farr in the UK. Uh, earlier my, Martin Parr, yes, yeah. but less so the later stuff, uh, his later work. Um, uh, I don't know why, it just doesn't doesn't resonate with me as much as say somebody like with William Eggleston or Stephen Shaw. Um, and I wonder if that's to do with scale and medium as well. It, it could be. Process, well, maybe, yeah. maybe I just haven't looked. You know. um, in terms of film, um, it, yes, uh, I mean, I'm fascinated by you know, films like Stalker or Stalker, as the Russians call it, uh, Tarkovsky, you know, there's sort of there's a, a kind of uh, dystopian bleakness that I quite like uh, about film with films like that. Um, uh, oh, gosh, I'm, I, I, I suppose um, when when I was a student, it was and film was emer beginning to emerge as an artistic medium. I got really interested in American underground film. And uh, one particular artist, I mean, yeah, you saw films by Andy Warhol and Jonas Mikas and um, Kenneth Anger and people like that, that I, at the time I really admired. But one particular artist, a guy called Gregory Markopoulos, um, had a particular way of editing film, which he did in the camera. So using a Bolex uh, 16 millimeter camera, he would yeah. have a frame counter and, and note the number of frames he'd shot on a particular scene and then uh, blank out a bit of film, note the frames again, and then wind the film back and then fill it in with things, you know. And, I remember this beautiful film, which had pretty powerful influence on me for painting. It was it was called Ming Green. It's a very Ming short Green. film. Ming Green. It's about eight minutes long, and it's about a room that is his his mother's room, and it's just a beautifully observed, very slow paced. Um, study of a, of a space, you know, it's just, just a lovely, lovely, I've tried to find it. I have, I did find it once on, I think it was probably YouTube or something like that, but I've not been able to retrieve it. You know, it okay. just seems to be very elusive. There are other things by Gregory Markopoulos that you can find, but um, he, did, he made a film called Twice a Man. And, um, but that particular one was for me a, a really, beautifully poetic film and so yeah I've been influenced by films like film that. and photography yeah which yeah. I think is um I think we can't help but be yeah. really because they're such profound yeah uh, cultural influences um, good okay and philosophers oh God, philosophers wow uh I I'll tell you, when we were talking about painters, I did, I forgot to mention Agnes Martin. Yes. Because it links with this idea of philosophy, if you like. She, her, I love the stillness of her paintings. Well, we've yeah. talked about her as well in, before. We've had discussions yeah. about her. And, um, and she's, she, she's written quite extensively about her work. It's a German publication called Schriften, yeah. which is, appears in German and English. 
uh, so is one page is in German, the other's in English. And I have a copy somewhere, but you can't get a copy now. Um, and it's just her reflections on her work. And I remember a line where she said she likens the looking at abstract painting to sitting on the sea, sitting at the seashore, watching the waves roll in. There's a sort of eternity to it and, yeah. a, and yeah, yeah, yeah. it invokes a contemplativeness that she wanted to have in her paintings. And I think that, that I mean, we talked earlier about um, the, uh, something about you know, art being didactic in, in it, when it deals with issues and yeah. me not necessarily wanting that. And one of the, I mean, this is quite an obscure, I mean, it's, there's a philosopher called Su Suzanne Langer. Who He's wrote, great, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote a book called Philosophy in a New Key. And in it, she talks about the origins of art, um, a sort of primordial origins of art and what art could mean. And um, I read that when I was doing my PGC and it had quite a profound influence on me, more so than the, th the thing that everybody else was reading, which was Herbert Reed's Education Through Art. But with Suzanne Langer, I, what I understood was that there is something that art can articulate within. So it's a process of articulation that um, it's not it's not necessarily a language as as in written language or anything like that. But it nevertheless has the function of a language in as much as for the maker or the viewer, it can articulate things like emotions and I felt that that was quite important in terms of teaching that, yeah. that, that kids but initially because that's what I was doing kids could in making art could come to manipulate materials and colors and shapes and so on and at the same time articulate things that they could identify with and I strongly believe that because I you know I carried on that approach as a teacher in higher education but it but it occurs at a different level it's because there's more more of a consciousness about you know what yeah. students yeah, 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 yeah. want to be doing you know and and what it means to them and so on so yeah well, there's, so, you know, so, Lange, there's so much not Susan Langer was a, a, a an important philosopher and then there were because so, so I was interested in I've always been interested in the idea of uh, communicating through art and, and the sort of idea of language and meaning and so on. So uh, I was interested in Wittgenstein and the Tractatus. I was interested in um, A.J. Eyre and his, his things that he's written about communication and what it can do. Um, Gilbert Ryle. These are all philosophers that are out of fashion really because um, the whole area of semi semiotics was taken over by French thinkers like Roland Barthes and so on and, and although there are uh, things that, that I've read that have, that I found resonate so you know the death of the idea of the death of the author and the idea of uh, context being important in interpreting art I think it's something that I've seen as, as important, but um, really my in, any interest in philosophy was more to do with those English, I think they're Cambridge philosophers that... that um, yeah, they come out of the uh, Jay Austen, they come out of the actual, the positivists and those... That's right, the logical positivists. Yeah, yeah, they come out of those, which is, um, which, is some of which are great, some of which are too reductive. For my thinking, but um, yeah, yeah. And also, I love Derrida and Deleuze and uh, Bordeaux and some of those. Yeah, especially on public space. Yes, and, uh, yeah. and the issues about space and place that they yeah bring up in quite a different way. Yeah, so, as a 
Yeah. I mean, a... when I was thinking about urban spaces, there's obviously, um, was it Mark Auger and um, the idea of non-place? Yeah. And uh, 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 Maurice de Serta and... Um, and Uri yeah. is also quite interesting. And um, of course, Umberto Eco, who is, you know... Yeah, yeah. Just pretty wonderful on most so, things. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm a deeply read in philosophy but there are ideas that i've found resonate with me and uh, uh, you know sort of held them um, they they're in my head and have some kind of influence i think and then i i think finally i wanted to really ask go back to the beginning and ask a little bit about the influence of malevich on your malevich. work and the russian suprematist influence which yeah, yeah must have been quite strong in 1960s 70s germany it was, well it was yes because as i said to you um in the early part of this interview is that uh, i was pretty exercised about the role of art within this political context that i found myself in i really you know i had you know, I had a girlfriend who said, well, what's what you're doing got anything to do with the horrors that are going on in Vietnam, you know, and I, I couldn't really answer um, that. And so, uh, but on the other hand, I couldn't see how I could make paintings about the horror horrors of Vietnam. I mean, a documentary filmmaker could do that much better than I could. And I didn't, I, I didn't necessarily want to pursue those skills. So I, the, the, the interest in Malevich and Elisitsky and those early Russian constructivists really came out of, well, at a time of radical political thinking, you know, about Marx and Lenin, I saw those artists as creating an analogy, a visual analogy of that radicalism. They were prepared to, um, and it, it, it really was a, a process of, you know, dialectic process. They, there was a sort of tradition of painting in Russia associated closely with icons. And, and, um, and it seemed that Malevich sort of took that idea of an icon and destroyed it, got, got rid of the sort of religious content of it. And in its place, he put a, 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 a radical, uh, an alternative radical icon in it, which was the simplest form you could make, which was, was a square, you know, a black square, which had, so it was, it was the complete antithesis to the sort of icons that he, 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 that was so prevalent in, in Russia. Oh, the Russian Orthodox religious icons, which are very beautiful things, many of them. Yeah, they are in their, their own right. Um, uh, sadly, um, I mean, I suppose when you look at sort of uh, some of Elisitsky's abstractions, there, there is an illustrative content to them, the sort of the white and the black and the red and so on. And, and, and uh, they symbolize things. But with Malevich, I felt there's a sort of radicalism there that was synonymous with the radical political intention. So that was my, my interest in, in, in Malevich. And that coincided a lot with, um, with minimalism, which I also saw as quite a radical art movement, which- I'm, I'm very I'm, interested in that so so socio-religious source and i touch on it again a bit in deb's essay in the fact that so many of the american minimalists and post are, are actually european and eastern european emigres with jewish backgrounds and there's an yeah. awful lot of kind of hidden uh jewish influence within these movements yeah and, and at a time as a, at a time post pogrom post revolution and post um, mm. Nazi genocide and it there's an aspect of of for me it feels like a complete um complete renewal a complete scraping away or obliteration of the past and seeking essential truths and I'm I'm just trying to articulate that in a bit less of a dramatic way but I feel very strongly that there is this uh not not perverted or twisted but 
a flipping of a religious iconography very deliberately into something other. Mm. I Hopefully. suppose the, the, the one artist that is is Mark Rothko, you know, but... and Albers, and most of those painters yeah. are, are from Jewish yeah. or Eastern European families. Yeah, Central European yeah. Families. Arshel Gorky and um, uh, yeah, the, the Barnett Newman. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm more interested in those artists than I am, say, in Jackson Pollock, you know. Yeah. And, but Morris Lewis is another one, you know, another Jewish. Yes, there's just artist. nearly everybody when you make the list. You Helen kind of Frank. go, gosh, this is actually a list of uh, Helen, 21st, Helen, 20th, 20th century American Jewish painters. Helen Frankenthaler as yeah. well. You know. <laughs> all artists that I I admire, you know, all, all, all artists that I think are great. You know. and, and again, in the essay, I discussed the idea of nothing and no thing, which is ain't sof, ain't sof or, which is a yeah. very Jewish principle. Yeah, and the lack of iconogra iconography, uh, obviously, within Islam and fundamentalist uh, yeah. Christian yeah. sects, was the Lutherans I've, the same? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're. I've not been particularly conscious of it being a Jewish thing, but now you say yes, there is, there is something quite powerfully. Um, Jewish there because in, in Jewish cultures is there a history of imagery there isn't is it unlike Christian it's 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 uh, certain sects I mean it's the Hebrew alphabet that is the it's very like Islam in that sense as they yeah. know the you've had these great iconoclastic movements in Judaism in Islam and in Protestantism it's yeah. Catholicism that's retained the high imagery and the figuration Everything yeah. else kind of separates away, and the 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 Hebrew notion or the Kabbalistic notion certainly of God is no thing, is nothing, is yeah. everything comes from nothing. It's such a minimalist um, construct. It's fascinating to see it that. Is, yes, and and well, yes, it's quantum physics. <laughs> yeah, same thing. It it it, it reflects mm. uh, in 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 several different realities from the visual to the structural to the quantum there yeah, are very different yeah, yeah. aspects and forms of oh, color within yeah. that too uh, okay is that okay are you happy to yeah i'm happy with all that yeah so thank you uh john for spending the time to talk to me and for coming and bringing your wonderful show here which it, which will run till the end of january 2023 Okay. Um, and I look forward to seeing you back in France very soon. Yes, well, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity both to chat like this and um, and, and to sh share the work. I'm very grateful. Nice to see pleasure. you. Okay. Absolute pleasure.